this has been such a joyous experience for me because I noticed that my cravings were just like completely different, especially in certain phases of the cycle. They were basically non-existent. This is Life Work with Maya, where we talk about success on your terms and tune in to work and lives that feel spacious, abundant and aligned with who we truly are. The six phases of my glucose monitor journey. Today, I'm going to talk you through the various phases that I went through in terms of my glucose monitor journey. I believe it's six phases. Maybe I will add a couple of sub phases. Now, there is a trigger warning here. I do talk about weight in this episode. That is not my normal topic of conversation on this podcast, but weight is a massive metabolic indicator, right? So alongside sleep, energy levels, mood, ability to think clearly, that is one of the indicators. And I'm hoping that I'm going to talk about it in a way that is helpful and not triggering. But if that is a subject for you, which is sensitive and that you're likely to experience various emotions around, I don't know everybody's background who's listening. I just want to put that up front, flick over this episode. There's plenty of others. And if you still want to have some insights around nutrition, there are some really old episodes around nutrition that I used to do with Arthi. So feel free if you still want to get the health stuff to just go and dip into those episodes. So why am I an executive coach who works in corporate settings with leaders on their leadership and career journeys? Why am I talking about this subject? So my ethos as an executive coach and my framework that I use is all about upgrading, accelerating your career, not at the expense of your well-being. Now, a lot of that is psychological, and that's one of the things that led me to do my master's in positive psychology and coaching psychology. But a massive pathway is between our psychological and our physiological, right? So there's this really crazy term called biopsychosocial and all sorts of other versions of this. But ultimately, the pathways are really strong. And I'm going to be interested in whatever it is that is going to support both aspects, right, of our well-being. Metabolic health has huge impacts. I have experienced these on our mood, our ability to think clearly. So they are absolutely important in our careers and our working lives. I obviously do coach women who are over 40. And I happen to notice the sort of pattern of when we were talking about impact and presence and showing up at work, they were confiding in me and we were having open conversations I was always really happy to have open conversations about cycles and about weight gain that they've noticed and some of them would say that they did feel that it was holding them back in their impact so this stuff you know makes its way into the workplace Now, when I work with somebody, I want them to walk away having elevated their career, but never at the expense of other key aspects of their lives. I personally value health and well-being really highly. So I always sought in my career to balance these things. Sometimes it felt like they were at odds. And so I was always looking for the ways that they could actually be mutually enhancing so that not only are you going to enhance your career and uh, develop that, It's not going to be at the expense of that stuff, but it's actually going to benefit these other aspects of your life, health, well-being, being a key one. And the idea is that we want to expand and elevate so that everything expands and elevates. And so that's kind of why I also have an aversion to things around, you know, no pain, no gain or extreme health programs that require you to put everything else in your life out of whack to achieve them. I have criteria. I'm looking for stuff in the well-being sphere that doesn't drain our willpower, that doesn't restrict. I know for my high achieving coaches and clients that there can be a really important distinction between stuff that is in the kind of discipline side that then becomes a bit of self-flagellation, self-blame, and can tap into some sort of high achieving insecurity stuff. So I am not wanting to go there. I want to do things that are gently and positively encouraging, that are fun, that feel right, you know, that tap into those more intuitive, cyclical elements of our being. And of course, more than a coach, more than anything else, I'm interested in stuff that is personalized. 
right? I'm not interested in one size fits all. That used to actually be one of the taglines in this podcast in the intro. I used to say, look, this stuff is not one size fits all. That's why I'm a coach. That's why I like to work with people one-to-one or in groups where I can speak to the individual. And, you know, just from a kind of physical perspective, I know that my body responds completely differently to other people's bodies. Not only that, but it responds completely differently than it did 10, 15 years ago. So to my earlier selves, and it's completely different to my husband. So somebody of a different gender. And it's also responds differently to people who are from other racial backgrounds. So there are so many factors when it comes to our own physiologies. And I think this is why the glucose monitor piqued my interest so much because of all these criteria. I'm quite fussy when it comes to what I will let in when it comes to health and well-being, because I want it to meet all of those criteria. I want it to be fun, non-restrictive, enhance my whole life and, and all of those things. So I'm going to talk a very potted history now through my personal phases when it came to the glucose monitor. Okay, a very brief phase zero with when I probably had very little understanding of anything to do with blood sugar. Growing up, always quite hungry. So I remember I had an older cousin and she commented to me at a family gathering, you're always eating, Maya. That was a little bit of a... uh, harsh comment. But, you know, I used to, for breakfast, I used to have toast, white bread dipped in sweet tea. That was my breakfast. And obviously we know now from a blood sugar perspective, that being your first meal of the day is basically one massive roller coaster setting you up for a crash. So that was phase zero. Phase one probably had a bit more awareness about health. I remember going to India in my gap year with my friend. And one of the things we did was we went to this sort of health retreat, which was all about all things fresh and sort of really embedded that idea of, you know, the nutritional power of vegetables and fruit and and all of that great stuff. So that's sort of 18 plus. And so whilst I did have, you know, an absolute great love, like to me, there is nothing more joyous than a really gorgeous salad. Like I'm talking, you know, like a a hearty salad with all the macronutrients in it. I remember going to New York as part of my Goldman Sachs training and just being floored by the salad bars there. They were so like they, they were like sweet shops. They just had every color. They were so nourishing. They combined things in such a cool way. So for me, an awesome salad bar is a really exciting place. It's just like a flavor, you know, flavor explosion. But I still remember having really strong cravings because I still didn't really understand about balancing blood sugar. Then 30 plus is phase two, right? So I had phase zero when I had no knowledge, phase one, when I was developing some sort of nutritional understanding, maybe. Then I had phase two, which I believe started around kind of the stage of maybe having kids, maybe even before getting pregnant and starting to have a proper awareness of the role of blood sugar, good fats. Obviously, I then started the nutrition podcast with Arathi. So I would say I'd always had pretty, you know, quite a lot of interest in this stuff. So whether it was magazines I was reading or the latest sort of health book, like I was always interested in upping my knowledge. And so at the right time, that kind of understanding about blood sugar and the importance of keeping it stable, you know, was there for me. And I remember one of the earliest pieces of content that I shared that was very popular was around the bulletproof coffee. And this very much is in line with the idea of having stabilized blood sugar, because obviously putting in and mixing in, whether it's coconut oil, which is what I do, or MCT oil, grass fed butter, these things mean that when you have that coffee, you're not spiking your blood sugar with other things that people often put in coffees to kind of make it creamier and can spike you. So definitely that awareness was there. Phase three I think actually was takes me up to this year. So maybe it was like, you know, Christmas time or maybe the beginning of of this year when I learned that you can have a sensor, that you can have a continuous blood sugar monitor. And this was through Arthi, who I believe at this point had started wearing one. And then she herself was looking for people to be case studies. And me and my husband were willing guinea pigs on this. She wanted to have me wear it for at least a full month, right? Because the sensor only lasts, each sensor only lasts for two weeks. So she got us wearing the Freestyle Libra 2 glucose monitor, which I share all the details of in this one hour course that I've put on Udemy. And for me personally, 
This happened to coincide with, I think it would have been probably like eight to 10 months, a period of very slow and steady weight gain. Despite, you know, my behaviors actually being a lot better than they were five years earlier, for example, drinking less, consistent on my strength work and various other good things I think were in place. I've never been, you know, that good. There's always been quite a lot of junk around the edges, comfort eating, all that stuff, which I have talked about on this podcast. But, you know, there was nothing different and things that I had in inverted commas gotten away with before I was no longer getting away with, it seemed. Not only that, I felt like I always had quite a good thermostat personally, so that I sort of just knew the right time at which to flex things. And suddenly I felt like that thermostat wasn't really working for me. So for example, at the post, you know, sort of winter, where I always say that I get a bit of winter insulation, as the warmer months approach, that kind of March period, it didn't shift. That winter insulation sort of just stuck there. And again, I want to put the disclaimers here, right, around weight stuff. So I follow a lot of body positive people on Instagram, for example. I have been indoctrinated as well with the people that I listen to on podcasts. So the Laura Vandercams, who are not interested in devoting loads of mental headspace to matters around weight. It's a really no nonsense attitude that I find really freeing. But I, I think that has to be balanced with I have a very strong value around health and weight can be an indicator of that. And basically, as I was approaching spring and summer, my summer clothes just didn't fit. And specifically, I could feel it around my middle, which is often a sign of a visceral fat. Not always. So again, disclaimer here, no, you know, and I'm not a doctor. This is my personal experience, but visceral body fat, which is known as that sort of hidden fat, is fat stored deep inside the belly, wrapped around the organs, including the liver, the intestines, and it's it's not good. You're better off having subcutaneous fat, you know, sort of just general fat under, you know, that kind of wobbles and stuff. It's not cool to have visceral fats really metabolically not good and has various other health health implications. So, you know, as much as I want to be body positive and I don't want to be devoting loads of energy around this stuff, I also don't want to have my head buried in the sand and ignore signals and signs to, you know, that something needs to change, that something, you know, was not working for me anymore as I entered my 40 plus years. And obviously there are hormonal shifts going on as well. So I was also aware that my energy just wasn't that great. My mood was lower at times. So sort of waking up with a lower mood, which for me is not usual. And I remember commenting to a friend about this and she said, that's not like you, Maya, which is true. I'm not somebody that struggles hugely with low mood. I also brain fog, like literally just sitting at my desk with kind of what felt like a fog. You know, some of this is associated with, you know, perimenopause, but I was just aware of all these things and actually just not feeling great. And again, you know, when it comes to weight for me, as somebody who's short and small build, you know, every extra pound does show on me. It's typically always taking me a long time to put on and lose weight, which has its benefits and disadvantages. So we're not talking about huge amounts of weight here. But from what I understand, that is also when there's not very much, it does often need to be a very slow and steady process. You're not going to be able to shift that stuff or move it very quickly. And so I knew that anything that I did was going to have to be super gradual, super steady. And while we're on this topic, these quite sensitive topics around weight and all these specific things, I also realized I needed to mention about calories. So as part of having worked closely with RT over the years, and even when we did our nutrition podcast, I think it's quite early on, I did away with that as a measure of things. There were a few reasons, and this is probably another separate topic of its own. There are now podcasts out there that will talk about the fact that it was very much to the food industry's advantage to talk about calories because then it became our problem as consumers to manage that equation rather than the fact that they were selling us crap basically and stuff that was not metabolically helpful. So there's that angle. There is also the idea of having to obsessively count and that just sounds really, really restrictive and we're going for an approach here that's not meant to feel restrictive. And then of course it's not 
it doesn't do anything to tell us about the quality of those calories. And so that is completely at odds with the whole blood sugar thing. And I just think it's so much more joyful to work with what your body needs from a macronutrient perspective than have to sit there meeting some sort of a daily target. Now, again, you might have a very different approach that works for you. I'm not necessarily here to debate that. But if you wonder why these are not mentioned throughout, I've actually had to come in and insert this segment later on because I realized that it's become so obvious and natural for me. But for many others, it's still the language that they use when it comes to anything to do with health, metabolic, weight loss, all of that stuff. So I just wanted to come in here and say that, you know, when I talk later on about managing what I ate, it was actually just managing it from a blood sugar perspective, but it was never ever from a calorific perspective. And it's almost gone so far for me that it's just off my radar that I've had to sort of come back in and make sure that's added in. But to me, it's a real beauty of this approach. It feels so much more intuitive, so much more free, so much more relaxed to just be able to work with understanding our responses to things and really understanding how much managing our blood sugar can really contribute to long-term metabolic benefits that we don't really have to worry about that stuff. I mean, how liberating is that? I think it is. So I had Arathi talking about the glucose monitor, wanting us to do the trial. This is still phase three. I had some trips coming up and I was also focused on some other goals. So I knew this would be a bit of a mental undertaking just to kind of get the thing on, the monitor on and stuff. So I kind of just postponed it a little bit. And I think we got to June, which is when I put it on just to the end of May. So that's now we're getting to phase four. So phase four was actually getting this glucose monitor on. I was lucky enough to have Arthi, who literally Zoom called me and we put it on together. But, you know, I found that really, really important. And that's why in the course that I've done, I have got a section where I actually put a monitor on. And the feedback is that that has been super helpful because people just want to be handheld through that process. So I've had a few people actually put it on watching that video. It's got all of the kind of instructions as well about how you prepare the site and stuff. And ultimately, I think just seeing me do it and barely even flinch when I put it on for people who are a little bit squeamish, the idea that they're going to be putting something into their body like a small needle, it can really help. And again, everyone's got different pain thresholds, so I can't talk to that. But I can say that compared to anything like having a blood test or having an injection or anything like that, we are in a different world. We're into more of like a little prick, you know, and then it stays stuck to your arm through strong adhesive. So it's not just hanging on (laughs) by that needle. Right. Okay. So this is phase four. We've got the thing in. And um, I'm starting to notice some really interesting things. So the first thing was I was still feeling pretty flat and demotivated. I've actually, I recorded a video around then of how I was feeling. And I started to notice like, wow, there are things here that are spiking me that I thought I was doing myself a huge favor when I was eating, but actually they're spiking me. So a typical thing was yellow dal. So as Indians, you know, we think that we're eating protein because we eat lentils. And actually these things were spiking me through the roof and not just me, they spiked my husband as well. And so I used to wonder like, why am I getting drowsy in the afternoons after lunch? Well, it was because something that I thought was really healthy was not. And this has been the key for me. It's like, I don't want to advocate for anything hugely restrictive here or anything which is like, you know, a a keto diet. We'll get onto that actually. Keto is not what I've discovered is, is the solution here by any means. But what I do want and what I know that my clients want is when you think you're doing your body a favor that you actually are and you're not actually spiking it in the process. So I talk about other examples of this in the course, things that I thought were going to be really, that I was doing myself a favor that I wasn't. And so there's nothing more frustrating than watching your body metabolically kind of slow down basically. But you know, when you feel like you were like this train that used to move really fast and now like you are just like your wheels are like really rusty and <laughs> the whole thing is just going really slowly. There's nothing more frustrating if you think you're doing all the right things, right? And that's what I love about this monitor is it will tell you, it'll be like, yep, that, that worked for me or 
you are in the middle of a massive spike here. And now I know for me personally that that is linked to when I start to feel a bit drowsy. And I've always been somebody that I didn't mention this in one of the earlier phases, but I remember being in that corporate life where, you know, you go and get a sandwich for lunch. And I remember I actually used to have to have a little nap under the desk sometimes. And I wasn't the only one. I remember having a friend when I was at PwC and we, she used to say, look, I just get so drowsy after lunch. I just need to go and find somewhere quiet to have a nap. So I used to do that. And I used to think it was quite energizing then to kind of get that like 10 seconds of of shut off. But clearly there was something going on metabolically already then for me. So we're still in phase four, monitors are on. I'm noticing all the different ways that I am impacted by what I'm consuming. I'm keeping quite a close log of all that stuff. And I am in heavy communication with Arati. Really lucky to have that. Appreciate that everyone is not going to have that kind of access because she was also experimenting with it and learning loads of stuff around it. We were having a really rich dialogue around that. That's what I've wanted to capture into the program because I know that in that first few weeks of having it, you have a lot of questions. And I was lucky enough to get some of that information from Arati, but I also went on a bit of an informational rampage. Like I was just searching everything I possibly could. The thing I really struggled with was to find the good ranges, like to find acceptable ranges. So that's another thing that I've put into the course uh, with Arati's input, some really useful guidelines around what you should be aiming for in ranges, because I found the information online ranging from NHS to other private companies. I found it really, really hard. And that's where her input has been so, so valuable. So we've got like literally just a reference table in there, which serves as a guide. It's not definitive. There's all kinds of caveats around it, but it's the thing that I didn't have initially when I first put the monitor on. And it's part of the information that she's been gathering as part of her case studies as well and all of her work in this area. Now, one other thing I noticed in this phase was I could describe myself as a fairly obsessive person. So it used to be in earlier years, used to be the stock market. I used to always check the stock market. In the early days of this podcast, I used to check download numbers Basically, it's just this sort of slightly gamified, obsessive part of my personality. And I really found the glucose monitor quite a fun thing for that. So I know that in the early days, I was checking it all the time. And RT was telling me that I was scanning it a bit too much. Oh, this has to be done. You know, like I know myself and I know that I kind of, I knew how to manage myself. So it wasn't sort of in a negative, obsessive way. It was more just like, I found it really fun. I found it quite, quite a fun game. So instead of checking some other thing, I thought that was quite a useful thing to check. Anyway, that's more of a side note. Okay, let's talk about phase five. So phase five was when I sort of said to myself, okay, I've done two cycles, which is that that's what Arati wanted. But you know what? This has been such a joyous experience for me because I noticed that my cravings were just like completely different, especially in certain phases of the cycle. They were basically non-existent if I was managing what I ate. So I kind of had a bit of a good as gold phase where I, I knew that I was probably being a little bit over good when it came to the monitor and sort of over cautious about spiking myself. So still now, when I look back at my stats, it was those early rounds of using it where my glucose levels were the lowest because I was managing it quite closely. And I knew that that's just some factor of my personality is that initially I would probably over adjust my behaviors and then eventually, you know, real life will kick in. And so having done that good as gold phase, I wanted real life. And I knew that in the summer I was going to be out of routine. We were going to be doing a lot of travel in places like Italy, France. You're going to, you're part of travel is obviously enjoying all the different foods. And so I wanted to have it on during those periods now. Again, I'm fickle as well. So, you know, if I say something, I'm going to do something for a long time, you never know if I'm really going to stick with it. So I said I was going to wear it for a good few months, but it, I also had a kind of, let's just see how this goes. As long as this is serving me, as long as this feels good, as long as I can notice all the positive benefits that I'm noticing, then I I just keep wearing it. Okay. Phase six has been starting to understand again, through all of the research that I've been doing, how this interacts with hormones. So I know I have a lot of male listeners on this podcast as well as female listeners. And so for you men, it's a bit simpler. You don't need to worry about the menstrual cycle, 
but I do think it's really useful information. And I have passed this on to some of my male clients for their partners because they've been really interested in this. So if you're listening and you're a man and you're thinking, oh, well, this part's probably not so relevant for me, think about who it might be relevant for. Because again, this is that kind of information that I'm just thinking, why did I not know this a decade ago? It would have made my life so much easier. All those periods, you know, those premenstrual periods where your cravings go through the roof. And I kind of always thought that was just a facet of my personality. And it's like, well, no, it's my hormones and they need something specific right now. They're trying to build progesterone. So they need this stuff. It's too much information here for me to break down, but that's what I do in the one hour course. Actually, some of this stuff is quite new. And so even when I was then sharing it back with Arathi, she said, actually, some of this stuff is new for me as well. And that's why I wanted to put it into the course as a human being going through the experience, because I would say it's been the real icing on the cake has been syncing it up closely to my menstrual cycle. So having an app where I track that, knowing exactly where I am in the cycle, knowing exactly what the type of symptoms are that I will experience and then syncing my nutrition, my training in the gym and obviously my glucose accordingly. Now, again, I just want to stress that I am very much a 60, 70% person. So when I say sinking my nutrition, I mean, you know, vaguely knowing that I am in the week before my period and therefore I'm going to be leaning into more carbohydrates and that won't be all sweet potatoes and, you know, the kind of healthiest form of carbohydrates that will include a fair share of junk food as well. And knowing actually that there's another phase earlier in the cycle as well, another hormone building phase where I need to lean in more to the carbohydrates. But the best bit of all has been then understanding how this interacts with fasting, because everybody has been talking about intermittent fasting for a long time. I was always a bit nervous about it because I'd heard it can impact your hormones and I never really knew how. Now I understand that I can actually brave an attempt a fast, like a proper fast, but I just know when's the right time to do it for me. So that's been incredibly powerful. And again, I get into that stuff in the detail that's required so that you can actually see the stuff in this one hour course. So what I would say in conclusion is that who knows, there's probably a phase seven here and a phase eight as I continue, you know, especially us women, our bodies are continuously evolving. I'm going to be going through various stages in my hormonal journey. And so I could be here maybe in a few years time saying, yeah, I had some other, you know, sort of low phases and things kind of went awry. Where I am now is so much more empowered, so much more confident, so much more excited about all of this stuff, because I know that there are things that I can do to directly impact my energy levels and my health. And again, trigger warning, about to talk about weight, but you know, I am over this very sort of relaxed period of the summer where we were completely out of routine. I did strength train during that period, but there's a lot of things that we just were sort of all over the place. I did manage to just shift that stubborn four pounds that for me, somebody of my size and build, and again, this is completely personal to me, that's the difference between my clothes fitting and not fitting. So for me, (laughs) there is a like a really practical element there of like being able to get back into my, my usual clothes again. So that's been very nice. When it comes to the gym, I have the most incredible personal trainer, Danielle. We work in a very specific way. I've worked with other personal trainers over the years, but my relationship with Danielle is very sort of a very coachy relationship and and super positive. And she's, bless her, she's never really told me kind of on email, well done. But in August, she sent me a well done over email because she tracks all the things I'm lifting and all the weights that I'm working on. And she was like, you know, like smashing August well done. So that's the first well done I've ever had from her on email. And I know it's because I've been timing my training around the cycle. There's a week before where I do things really, really differently when it comes to my cycle. And it has just unlocked a new level of strength in me. I thought that as a hypermobile person, as somebody now, you know, where where, where I'm, I'm at an age where it's really hard to maintain muscle, I thought that was it. But actually, we've been able to just build and build recently. And there's nothing more empowering. I don't think there's anything more empowering than feeling like you're physically strong, especially when you're a small, small female like me. It can be like really good for 
self-esteem and confidence, I think. Mental clarity. So at the beginning of this journey, I tried a couple of fasts and the brain fog was just, it was so extreme. And I do now think looking back that that was part of things kicking into gear and things kind of moving along for me. And now I can really say that that fog that I experienced has gone. I still will sometimes, and I I talk about this in coaching with clients sometimes, I'll be about to say something and it will just disappear from my head. So that sometimes still happens, but that fog, oh gosh, that has completely disappeared. And then the final one is sleep. So especially at specific phases of the cycle where I am focused more on lowering blood sugar, and that comes a lot more easily for me, the sleep is then just awesome. And I wake up feeling really, really good. So yes, weight is definitely one indicator for me, or it has been, but these other things as well have been really, really exciting. So definitely check out the Udemy if this has made you think that you might want to try a glucose monitor in a fairly low stakes way, because I haven't yet done Zoe. I might do it in the future because there's a couple of other things that that tests, but that wasn't the direction I wanted to go in initially. I wanted to really, really get to know my blood sugar stuff first and do sort of one thing at a time. And also knowing what I'm like, I wanted to do it over a lot more extended period so that it would give me that really complete picture and that cyclical picture. And not only did I want to do it across a one month menstrual cycle, but I want to do it over the different seasons of the year. So obviously I put it on in June. So there was a whole summer period which came with different factors such as you know different weather different light the light is different right so you wake up at different times and different routines and then I want to do it going into the winter period now which will have other cyclical elements and seasonal elements as well and what I think is the beauty about the freestyle libra and they're really good they give really good customer service if for example the monitor falls off prematurely and things like that they're really really good What I like is I feel like I've got my own little personalized nutritionist on my arm, you know, telling me what's going on inside, because I I just, I think that's always been the missing piece for me. It's sort of saying, look, I've got the knowledge, I've got the psychological understanding, but the thing I didn't have was that real feedback from my actual body about what's going on inside. And that for me is not something that I can just do for two weeks of wearing a monitor. I want to do that over a longer period. And so that's what I'm talking about in the course and setting you up for. So yeah, let me know if you give that a try. I think on Udemy, they change the prices quite a lot, but we're talking about less than 50 pounds or something like 50 pounds. But sometimes I think it's on a discount of like 20 pounds. So definitely check that out. And even if you're not quite ready to put the monitor on when you are, it will be a really good knowledge base to start from so that you're not scrambling around at the beginning like I was or entertaining a lot of calls. So between me and my husband, we've entertained quite a lot of calls from people who've put the monitor on and then gone, oh my God, and wanted to have a little chat about it. This basically just codifies and structures all that information in one place. So I hope you'll find that useful and I hope it was interesting for you to hear my journey. Like I said, it's not my primary focus professionally, glucose monitors, for me personally, it has been one of the things this year that has had a life-changing impact on me. And that's why I wanted to share it. And I know that that is of importance to my clients and therefore is likely to be of interest to you guys. So let me know how you get on and let me know any feedback that you have. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Life Work with Maya. If you've got to this point, I'm guessing you found it valuable. So do share the link with somebody else who can benefit. In an age of materialism and us trying to stay on top of clutter, what could be nicer than to send a non-clutter digital link to somebody and say, I listened to this and I thought you might love it. What a great way to show your care and consideration for them. If you haven't left a review, now is the time and make sure that you are subscribed on Spotify or you're following along on Apple Podcasts. And if you really want to help the show grow, then do share the link on IG stories, Instagram stories, or reshare or discuss your thoughts with my LinkedIn posts. You can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Do you feel free to send me messages there? I love having dialogue with my listeners um, and the links to those handles are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and I look forward to connecting with you next time. Bye-bye.